Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we're mindful of what it must have been like for people back prior to your son coming to earth, living in bondage, living subjugated to the Romans, wanting deliverance, wanting salvation, and just pleading that Messiah would come. And God, in a similar way, we live here now in this fallen world after he's come and paid the price. And it's so broken. And we, we await, Lord, the coming again of your son, Jesus. We'd ask that you'd take the time that we have here to be better equipped to serve you and him. And that we might shine his bright lights in this darkness until he comes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. I want you to watch this video in uh, preparation for our message. Well, between Jack's back taxes and the Fred Hayes show, I'd say that was a pretty successful broadcast. Next we show up. Thank you very much, Houston. Uh, we got a couple of housekeeping procedures for you. We'd like you to roll right to zero, six, zero, and null your rates. Roger that, rolling right, zero, six, zero. And then if you could, uh, Give your oxygen tanks a stir. Roger that. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. We have a main bus B undervolt. We've got a lot of thruster What's activity here, Houston. Now? It just went offline. Oh, there's another master alarm, Houston. I'm checking a quad. Christ, there's no repress valve. Maybe it's in quad We've C. got a computer restart. I'm going to reconfigure the RCS. We've got a pin light. Fire, it doesn't make any sense. We've got multiple caution and warning, Houston. We've got a reset restart. All right, I'm going to SDS. So uh, Apollo 13 was launched on April 11th, 1970 from the Kennedy Space Center. And it was going to attempt a lunar landing until one of the oxygen tanks exploded uh, two days after they departed. And what it did, it ended up crippling the service module, which then um, impeded the command module from doing what it was supposed to do. And they had a major problem. Here were a list of some of the things that they were experiencing. They had limited power, loss of cabin heat, shortage of water. Um, they had to make shift repairs to a, a carbon dioxide removal system. Uh, but they were fortunate that they did return on April 17, 1970, which was five days, 22 hours, 54 minutes, and 41 seconds from the time they took off. The three guys in this picture are John Swigert, Jr., Fred Hayes, Jr., and uh, James Lavelle, Jr. Now, the reason I bring this up is that phrase, Houston, we have a problem, is fairly common. And these three guys certainly, in their adventure, had a problem. What I'd like to share with you this morning is that I have a problem, you have a problem, we have a problem. In fact, we have a problem from the time we're born uh, until we pass from this earth. And there's nobody who escapes having this problem. You have this problem before you're a follower of Jesus. This problem exists within you um, after you're a follower of Jesus until you go to be with him or until he'll come to get you. It's not, a small, it's not a small problem. In fact, I think it's one of our greatest, greatest challenges, one of our greatest problems. And this is what it is in summary. We make much of ourselves and little of Christ. We make much of ourselves and little of Christ. If you let that sink in, obviously, that is a problem. We have a way of redirecting every conversation back to ourselves, somehow highlighting ourselves, whether it's reposting something on Facebook, on text, uh, any type of social media, Instagram. It's look at me, look at me, hear me, listen to me, watch me. Um, 
it was interesting because I had been preparing the message, so this is really on my heart. I want to be conscious that uh, I don't do this because I realize this is such a problem that we all have that we make much of ourselves. So I'm very conscious. It's like, I, Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to make much of myself. I want to make more of you. And here we are at a small group on Wednesday night, great group of people, love them, love being with them. And it came up, one of the guys in there was uh, considering a, a different employment, and well, we were talking about resume, and I said, man, you ought to let me do, you ought to let me do the resume. Uh, I did the last four resumes for my kids, and they each got a job. And just that subtle, just that quick, I just felt that in my spirit. Yeah, there you are, Kirk, just making much of yourself. <coughs> making much of yourself. And so I recovered. You know, I was able to go, it was the Spirit of God stepping in there and going, but the reason I believe those, those resumes <laughs> uh, did what they did and my kids were able to get a job like they did is because we did, we did pray about them, we prayed over them, we prayed through them. And, uh, but my point is that there's this wrestling match within our souls about making much of ourselves and little of Christ when we know that it ought to be completely the opposite. We ought to make much of Christ and less of yourselves. Right? Just makes sense. Make much of Christ, less of yourself. But we would, we would acknowledge that it's a problem, right? That we, all of us, recognize we have a propensity to do this, to make much of ourselves. That we uh, have this innate, we, and we need to acknowledge our proclivity to just point things to ourself and redirect things back to ourselves. And if, I think this is important. If we're able at some juncture to recognize that we're predisposed to this tendency and that apart from the supernatural God changing that, that's the way we live. It's the way we operate. And even as followers of Christ, the moment the Spirit's not prevailing in our walk, guess who becomes front and center again? It's us and it's not Christ. And that's certainly that's certainly a problem. In our passage, as we continue in this great reveal series, we're in our sixth installment of that. And what we find is that there's a little competition thing going on. And, and it's not Johnny B. that's bringing, John the Baptist, who's bringing the competition or making it a competition. It happens to be those who have found themselves uh, drawn to him. They gave their lives to God. He baptized them. Their lives are different, and they're pumped about that. But then there's this other one that comes on the scene, and his name is Jesus. And what you find is people are being drawn to him, but they've already had their connection with Johnny B. And it's like, oh, my gosh, what's happening over here? And so it's this weird kind of competition that's taking place. And John the Baptist knows why he's here knows that he's here to do the great reveal, to make the Messiah known, and to have him be the one who's lifted up and pushed to the front. But what comes out in this passage is that that's not humanity's tendency. That's not our propensity. We are bent towards making much of ourselves and less of Christ. You'll see it in the passage. The background, Jesus had just been in Jerusalem Speaking to a, a ruling council authority, his name was Nicodemus. He was, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and he was meeting Jesus under the cover of night, right? It's nighttime. He didn't want to be exposed as somebody who was curious about the things of Christ. So he finds himself meeting Jesus at night. Jesus is telling this guy, you've got to be born again. You've got to have a new birth, Nicodemus. Then he's just laying it out for him. And uh, <clears throat> so that conversation takes place. But then what follows that <clears throat> is Jesus is in Jerusalem for that conversation. But now he's going out into the Judean countryside. And so it's going to be less, uh, less urban, a little bit more rural, rural. And that's where we pick up in our story you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 3. We'll begin with verse 22 and uh, the following verses. And if not, it'll certainly be up on the screen. But it begins this way. After this, Jesus, after this conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. I want to make a few observations. We'll leave this verse up here on the screen. Uh, Jesus is in the Judean countryside, not in Jerusalem. And it says he had his disciples. And whenever you see this in the scriptures, your mind immediately runs to the 12. But it wasn't the 12 in this case. Perhaps one or two might have been present. We don't know that. But it was not the 12. And I'll share with you why here in a moment. 
And then there's this thing about, and he baptized. And so when you read that, you're, and, and baptized, so your mind immediately thinks Jesus is out in the countryside with his followers and he's baptizing them. I want to kind of step sideways a little bit from the message. The message is we ought to make much of Christ and less of ourselves, and less of ourselves and more of Christ. I want to step over here, just so you're not confused at where we are, and I want to clear up, clear up why we know these disciples that are with Jesus out in the Judean countryside were not the twelve. We find out in the scriptures, and we'll talk about this a little bit in more detail next week, that Johnny B. is going to find himself in prison, and he'll stay in prison until he dies. And so I want to read to you, just listen, from the book of Mark. It says this. John was put in prison. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee. Where is he right now in our story? Where is he in our story? Judean countryside. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, which is different than the Judean countryside. We believe he went there from the Judean countryside. He goes into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand, come near, repent, believe the good news. So he's sharing that in Galilee. And then it says, and Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon, his brother Andrew, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said, come follow me, I'll make you... Um, out to fish for people, or I'll make you a fisher of men. And so this all took place after, John's ba after John was in prison. So John is currently in our setting, in the story, in the Judean countryside with Jesus. So we know that this event precedes when he was in prison, and he didn't call his disciples until after he was in prison. So the disciples that are with Jesus are followers. It's another word for disciple, follower, a learner. And so that's who's with Jesus. There's another thing I want to highlight about this. This passage comes back up. Let's go back to it, Jericho. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. So people were being baptized. The question is, who's baptizing? And from their perspective, they were watching life change and people being baptized and hanging out with Jesus and the word was spreading. And they're assuming it's Jesus doing the baptizing. And oh no, John, you're over here baptizing. And oh no, Jesus is over there baptizing. But this is what it says just the next chapter in John. It says this in chapter 4. Listen real close. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. That's important. It plays an important role in our message for the day. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So he's going to leave Judea and then go to Galilee where he'll eventually call his disciples. So here's the context. He's out there. Some of his disciples are with him. Baptisms are taking place. And John's over here. He's at a different place. But the ones who are following John are, are, are beginning to understand that these people are following this Jesus. So in their minds, there's team one, Johnny B, because that's who they're connected with. And then there's team two, this Jesus who followed, who came after John, but people were beginning to connect with him. And here was their, their, here's what happened. In John 3, 25 through 26, it says, An argument developed between some of John's disciples and this certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. And they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, that man who, walked, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, referring to Jesus, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's gone to him. It's like, oh no, how awful. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny for us to read it because it's like the very thing that John wanted, the very thing that he came to do was actually happening, but it was freaking those out who were drawn to John. Do you see it? You feel the tension that they were, they were feeling? They're like, oh no. And what I, I thought was funny about this is like, oh, how horrible. Everyone's going to Jesus, right? And, and it could have been a lot worse. They could have been going to like a Judean strip club or a nightclub of some sort, right? Or a Judean casino. Uh, and I know, I know some of you went, ouch, because you're like, yeah. And maybe he could have been going to see, they could have been going to see Judean drug lords. In other words, it could have been a lot worse than they're going to follow this Jesus. Essentially what they're saying, here's another way of saying it. Uh, John, they're no longer following us. 
They're no longer following you. And see, they were associating their popularity and their identity and their sense of acceptance with John. And they wanted to see that thing flourish. And then that somehow that would be a reflection of them personally, that their tie, their identity was to John. And John wanted nothing to do with that. John knew that the very call on his life was to make one known, and that was Christ. And you know what? That same calls on you as a follower of Jesus. You have one call, and it's to make him known, and to keep pushing him forward, and to be lifting him up. That's God's call on your life. And that was God's call on their life, but they were missing it. They somehow thought they were in competition. And I find this uniquely relevant. Listen to me, church. This is unbelievably relevant. Today in churches all around the country, and ours is no exception, churches, staff, congregations, uh, elder, it, it just it crosses the gamut. Oh, they left, uh, they left our church, and now they're going to that church. Oh no, 20 of them left, and they're going to that church. Let me give you a bottom line on this. If 20 people leave here who are followers of Jesus and they go to another church that teaches Christ where they will grow, where they'll get connected, where they can advance the kingdom of God, no harm, no foul, multiplying the kingdom of God, we still praise God. Amen. Right? We do. Sometimes what happens is we can get hurt in the process because we had close relationships and they're friends and so forth. But we have to trust in the providence of God. Because sometimes he allows those things to happen for their benefit, for the church where they attend's benefit, for his kingdom benefit. And guess what? While that's happening, it's for your benefit and for my benefit. There are things he wants to expose. There are things he wants to purge. There are things he wants to purify. There are things he wants to get ready. But the goal is we're not in competition with any other local church. Amen. We're in, we're in competition with one, and his name is Satan, and his domain of darkness. There's the competition, okay? And guess what? If 20 or 30 people leave any church in Rowlett to go to another church, guess what? There's still 60,000 people in Rowlett that need Christ. It's not like they got them all. <laughs> now, seriously, right? There's like work to be done. I look at it this way. God just made an empty seed. He has somebody else he wants to put in it. And our role is to be a partner with God and find out who are those people that he wants to have sitting in those empty seats that are near you. Because I promise you, his heart is that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. We're not in competition with one another. Our competition is the evil one. Well, they're saying this. Everyone's going to him. Another way of saying they're not going with us. What's the goal? And what's your goal? Is your goal that they would come with you? They would follow you? I sure hope not. That's, that's not my goal. I don't think that's our goal. Our goal is that they would follow Jesus. That's our goal. That they would follow Christ. Now, Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. He says, follow me. But when he was saying that, he was saying, follow me as much as my life reflects following Christ. But he never put himself before Jesus. And we shouldn't either. Well, here's what happens. Johnny B is going to list a multitude of reasons. Seven of them. And I'll fly through these. So you're going to have to pay close attention. But he's going to list out at least seven reasons. And there's more. But for our time's sake, I cut it back. To seven reasons why we should make much of Christ and less of ourselves. Reason number one. John says this. He says a person can receive. This is what he's responding to them when they're worried about everybody going to be with Jesus. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Let that sink in. You make much of Christ and less of yourself because everything you have is from him. Everything. Everything. Every breath, every ability to see, lift your hand, move your arm, move your leg, have a job, think, guess where it comes from? It all comes from him. In fact, we read it over and over in the scriptures. Everything you have is from him. It says this in John 1, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word 
was God. He was with God in the beginning, speaking about Jesus. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In other words, he was in it all. He did it all. Colossians says it this way. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven, on earth, visible things, invisible things. Whether thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all things have been created. Through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And John is simply saying, make much of Christ and less of yourself because everything you have, you've received from heaven. Romans puts it this way, Romans 11. Oh, the depths and riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, not you. How unsearchable his judgments, not yours. His past, not yours, being traced out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Not me, not you. Who has been his counselor? Not you, not me. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? From him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. You see it? Make much of him. Much of him. Much of him. Old Testament passage kind of captures this concept. Psalm 89, 11 says, The heaven are yours, the earth is also yours, the world, and all it contains, you have founded them. And so John starts off with reason number one, everything you have comes from him. Reason number two, he says this, You yourselves can testify that I said, I told you from the very beginning you met me, I am not the Messiah, I am set ahead of him. I'm set ahead of him. In other words, your personal story and witness should, should let others know to make much of Christ and less of yourself. You should know in your mind and in your heart you didn't save yourself. You didn't change your life. You know that. That's your story. So your personal testimony and story just like John's. Um, Johnny B. continues to our third reason. He said the bride belongs to the bridegroom. In other words, those who believe are the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. And then he says, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is in full joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This is Johnny B in our story. He's attending. He's like the best man of the bridegroom. And when he hears the bridegroom, he's just filled with joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it's now complete. So his third reason for making much of Christ and less of himself, or you making much of Christ and less of yourself, is that you experience joy by making much of Christ. And I'm not sure if you've ever made this connection, but for those <coughs> in those moments where you're trying to snatch some of the glory that's his and push yourself to the front instead of him, there's just not joy in that process. In fact, it's like this insatiable appetite that you just want more and more and you keep trying to fill a spot that you'll never fill. Where when it goes the other way and you begin to make of much of Christ, there's so much joy there. Does that make sense? So his third reason is you experience joy by making Christ known. So make much of Christ. And then kind of this, this whole idea is embedded in this next verse. John says these words. He said, he must become greater and I must become less. So his fourth reason, yes, let's give the Lord a hand. Because he must become greater and us less. The fourth reason John is saying elevating Christ, it just makes sense. And, 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 the, and in, the, in the original language, the, the concept of he must become greater is in the present active. Just every moment, more and more and more, he should become more and more greater. Where the I must become less is in a present passive. And all that means is you can't do it yourself. Something outside of you has to cause you, as you allow it to, make him more and you less. And that presently should be happening. Present passive. Continue to allow God to have you take your rightful place and Christ have his rightful place. Jesus is at the center of everything. John says this, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He's at the center of everything. So the fifth reason is make much of Christ unless yourself because Christ is the ultimate authority. He's over all things. He's supreme. He's in charge. He's the boss. Can you say that with me? He's the boss. Let's say that. He's the boss. 
Let's say it again. He's the boss, which means he gets to make all the calls, all the decisions, and we simply submit to him because he's ultimate authority. And we trust him. We trust him. And so he goes on, the sixth reason Jesus walks in and... Um, let me read this first. John 3, 20, 32 through 34 says he testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. So his sixth reason is that Jesus is walking with an unlimited measure of the Spirit. So make him known, make much of him. Less of ourselves at this time, those who were followers of Jesus didn't have the indwelling of the Spirit. So he's saying, make much of Christ. He has an unlimited measure. And then finally, here's the seventh reason. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Not yours, not mine. The Father loves the Son and placed everything in his hand. And so whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, get this line, for God's wrath remains on them. Not will come on them, remains on them. So if you're here and you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that by believing you'll have life in his name, the wrath of God remains on your life. But he's saying, make much of Christ and less of yourselves because whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Who doesn't want that? So make much of Christ because eternity hangs in the balance. Do you hear? Does everybody hear me? Eternity hangs in the balance. So for those of you who have yet to trust in Jesus Christ, eternity is hanging in the balance. And the thing between your eternity being secure and not secured is you. And your desire to make much of you rather than much of Christ. And so the wrath of God remains on you. And let me speak for just 30 seconds to those of you who know Jesus. Do not confuse those who don't know God because eternity hangs in the balance. And every time you take a conversation and you snatch glory that's God, you're confusing those who don't know God. Because it would only make sense to those who don't know God to watch those of us who profess we know God to not take any of his glory. Because we know Everything we have is from him. We know our salvation is from him. Our strength, our joy, our peace, our comfort. Everything we have is from him. We should not confuse them by having moments where we're taking credit for anything. Does that make sense? So church, for the sake of kingdom, because eternity is hanging in the balance. I want you to pray a simple prayer when I'm done. And I'm almost done. God, help me. Help me, God. Make much of your son, Christ, and much less of myself. Take a moment. Will you bow your heads? For those of you who know God, would you just pray that prayer? God, help me. Make much of your son, Jesus Christ, and make much less of myself. And for anybody here who has yet to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're feeling the tension even in your spirit as I speak. Will you humble yourself and not make much of yourself and less of Christ? Will you simply call on his name? Just turn and say, I'm turning my heart to you, God. I'm, a, I'm trusting in your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. And he'll take that. He'll take your belief. He'll take you accepting him. And he'll cleanse you from those sins and the wrath of God will be removed because it's already been placed on his son for you if you'll just accept it. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that's in it. I pray that you help us to apply it. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to conclude by letting you know that we're having a baptism service coming up in January. And this is for people who said yes to God. Just like John was baptizing in the wilderness and those who were following Jesus, the disciples were baptizing. It's an outward expression of your faith that I am choosing now to follow God. If you've never done it, 
If you've done it as an infant, you didn't do it. Somebody did it to you and somebody did it for you. We believe the scriptures teach that this is a decision that you make as a follower of God, not somebody making it for you. If you've never done that, you let us know. We'd love to have you walk in faith and obedience and be baptized January 27. Can I have you stand? We're going to close. And there's people up here to pray with you if you'd like.